sell the January 95 put for 256, buy the January 92 put for 201. So total net credit is 55 cents for a net credit of 22.4%. Now, I can choose to refresh the browser or I can hit the search button again. Let me just go ahead and refresh the browser. So stock at 105.51, 256 and 201, and net credit of 55 cents. Okay, so let me go ahead and just refresh my browser. Win is now at 105.50. Put change to 257. Net credit is now 56 cents. Okay, and let's refresh once more. See if we get another change. Ah, win is now at 105.57. 257 for the put, which didn't change, so the net credit is still 56 cents. So it's not streaming real time, but every time you hit submit or refresh the page, Wayne, you're getting the numbers at that very instant. All right. Now, what did we do? We went into the search. We used default search as a stepping stone. By the way, this is the same process I would do in every strategy. If I was doing married puts, if I was doing collars, um, I'd start off in the search or with a sample search menu when looking for new positions. I'll adjust the criteria based on what I want to see. Now, once I have the results, am I going to go ahead and take the first result that's listed? Remember, I was sorting by highest return to lowest. So I'm going to jump right, am I going to jump right in and go ahead and trade this win position with a potential return of 23%, 56 cent net credit? Well, I'm missing some things, aren't I? I don't see the maximum risk, and I was screening by probability, so I don't see the probability here either. So what I want to do next, any of the criteria that you can filter by in the parameter field where we just adjusted our criteria, I can select to view in my results table to help me with my analysis. So to do that, we'll just click the See More, Less Columns button up here at the top. And this will pull up a configuration page for us. And I have my stock information. So if I wanted to make sure that I want, if I wanted to view the average stock volume for the position, for example, or maybe the shares outstanding, or if I wanted to view beta, um, for example, or any of the other fundamental and technical criteria, we'll just check the box next to that field. For the option information, I'm probably want to going to see the maximum risk. I'm going to want to see the probability. That's going to be very important to me. And if I wanted to, I could also select to view the um, volume. Uh, the sell option volume or buy option volume, for example, or the previous option volume, or I can view the open interest as well. That range out of the money, I might uh, percent out of the money, I might select that as well. Now, once I've selected which columns we wish to view, I can scroll down to the bottom and click Save and Return, or I can choose to reorder the columns. So I click Reorder Columns. What I'd want to do here is I'm going to move the probability up near the um, net credit and the calculated return, as well as the maximum risk. I'm going to put that next to the net credit. So you can just sort of uh, move these around based on how you like to view the screens. And once I've done that, I'll click Save and Return. We'll be prompted to refresh our page. We still have the same search results, and we still have the same search listed below. <clears throat> and we see that the win position is still at the top, and now we have a net credit of $0.57 because the... Uh, bid price of that 95 put went up to 258 but now we have our maximum risk so we're looking to make 57 cents with risking 243 we have a 76.8 percent probability our percentage out of the money we're about 10 percent out of the money 9.97 percent and then our other stock criteria that we've selected as well the average stock volume in the beta all right Paul asked something um, how does it calculate the probability for every option that we're tracking, all 350,000 plus calls and puts, uh, we calculate the theoretical probability that the stock would be trading at or above that strike price on the expiration date based on the past 52-week trading range of the stock. And then take a standard deviation of that value and allow us to apply a bell curve. So we can say based on where the stock has been in the movement of the position of the last 52 weeks, what is the likelihood that it will be trading at or above or at or below a specific strike price in the next 20, 30, or 50 days. Now that being said, when you're going through the filters on the screen, or the parameter uh, filters, or you're looking at the columns, if you don't know what a specific filter means or a specific column means, you can hover right over the column heading, or if we're down in the parameter field, I can hover right over the text link, and this will give you a pop-up definition uh, that describes the criteria. 
And if you click on it, if I actively clicked on probability, that would link me to the glossary page where it would give me a full description or a full definition, I should say rather, of that particular field. Okay, now again, let's just review real quick. We came into our strategy. We used the default search as a stepping stone. We adjusted the criteria based on what we wanted to see. Once we ran the search, we saved the search settings so we can always come back to it at a later date. If we want to look for new positions next week or next month, for example, we saved our settings so we don't have to go through that again. And then we use the See More or Less Columns button, of course, to add in some of the criteria that we might use in our analysis that we were filtering by. If I'm using a filter for probability, I'm using a filter for simple moving average, I probably want to see that in the results field. But I'm still not going to go ahead and jump right in and take this first position that comes up. What I want to do now is further research and analysis to see is this, not only is this a strategy that matches my criteria, okay, I've got my 23.5% 23.5% return, net credit of 57 cents, probability of 76.8%, for example, but now I want to make sure is this stock what I want to trade? Do I think this is actually a bullish to neutral stock? And yes, I put in some criteria to look for stocks that are in an uptrend, but you might want to use other uh, analysis. You might look at MACD. You might look at stochastics. So the first thing I do after I have my results is we'll go into the more information button on the far left hand side. And what I'm going to do here is I'll select charts and I can go to the one year snapshot or big charts. I typically prefer to go to big charts. It's a free charting service that you can link to, but you can customize it as well. Um, over here on the left, here's just a basic one-year chart. I can change it if I wanted to view, let's say, a six-month chart or a two-year chart, for example. And you can use different indicators as well. So if I wanted to look at specific moving averages, or if I wanted to look at Bollinger Bands, for example, also things such as MACD, uh, slower, fast stochastic, Williams percent R, you can select to view those on the specific screen. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I just had another question coming. This is more specific to the strategy. Paul wanted to know, in general, is there a recommended time frame to enter bull put credit spread or other types, five weeks or three weeks? Um, in those vertical spread, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, at the beginning when we were looking at the bull put credit spread menu, and I showed in the Learning Center, there are two links to vertical spreads, part one and part two. That's discussed a little bit, or that's discussed in those fields. Typically, if I'm doing a credit spread or a covered call, naked put, any income generating strategy, I'm staying under 45 days out in time. Now, this is one of those middle of the road ones where December's a little bit too close and January might be a little bit too far from my personal preference. I still might be looking at January. In essence, if you can find the return that you want, it's always best to go shorter time. If I'm able to sell month by month by month every 30 days, I'll always have a higher annualized return on my spreads than if I sold a spread that was two months or three months out in time. The initial net credit would be higher, but the way that options are priced is as I go further out in time, I'm lowering my annualized return if I'm selling positions and I'm increasing, um, and I'm also at the same time though, if, I buy, if I'm buying positions, if I buy further out in time, I'm lowering my average cost per day. So anytime I'm doing some of these spreads, um, <clears throat> excuse me, anytime I'm, I'm looking at these types of spreads, I'm typically only 30 to 45 days at a time. All right. So without going too much deeper into what I'm looking here at the chart, if I didn't like this chart or didn't like the pattern, I'll simply close down big charts and I'll just move to the next one. So here we have price line, high price stock of course, 40764. And I'll do the same process. First thing I'll look at is the stock chart. If I like the chart, I'll go ahead and place the trade or I'll go ahead and continue to research and analyze the position. And if not, they'll move on to the third position. Wayne, oh, I'm sorry, Tim popped up. How does the software determine the spread between bought and sold strike price? Well, my criteria filtered that, Tim. Okay? I didn't put in any restriction to the range between the strike prices. I told the system to find me spreads that had at least a 10% return, minimum probability of 75%, uh, some of the other filters I put in as well. You see here, we're looking at the top win position. Um, and I don't mean win by it's going to necessarily be profitable. I, that's just the symbol there. Here's the top one with the 95.92. Let's just look further down for a minute. I saw another one here. Further down, here's the second one. This still matches my criteria. It's a 92.87. This is a five-point spread. Still matches my criteria, Tim. It's got a higher than 10% return, net credit of greater than 50 cents, 
and uh, probability of 83%, which is greater than 75 I selected. I didn't put any restrictions in that I only want to see five point spreads or two point spreads or three point spreads, or I only wanted to have a risk less than five points or less than 10 points, but that is easily done. So if I scroll in for credit spreads, if I scroll back down to the bottom, okay, underneath the range out of the money, I can select to look for a strike difference range. So if I only wanted to see strikes, strike differences that were greater than two or greater than 250, for example, or let's say greater than or equal to $2.50 between the spreads, I could select that. If I was doing ETFs and indexes, and for example, I wanted to see strike differences that were less than $2, I only wanted to see one point spreads, we could select that as well. You can also do this using the maximum risk field in some range. I know that if I was doing a 10 point spread and collecting 50 cents, my maximum risk would be around 950, for example. If I didn't want to see spreads that were more than 10 points, I could simply use the strike difference to select that, or I could limit my maximum risk to be less than, let's just say 950. And that's just another change we can make, and we'll submit these settings. By the way, that second price line trade we were looking at, that's going to be removed as well. Ah, did I do that right? Maximum risk of less than 950. Oh, huh, that was interesting. Oh, I can't have anything that has a strike difference less than two. That's, that's why. So let's go back to any there. I apologize. I didn't realize I left that there. Now let's go back to 950. How about that? So the short answer to question, Tim, is it's going to determine the strike differences based on what I tell it to. Any of the criteria that I put in, that's what's going to restrict the strike differences. We're building, for credit spreads, we're building essentially 1.5, I think it's like 1.25 million bull put credit spread combinations and 1.25 million bear call credit spread combinations every 15 minutes. So if there's a spread out there that matches your criteria, whether you want to use one-point spreads, five-point spreads, or ten-point spreads, whatever I put in this criteria field, the system's going through that entire list and pulling up only those ones, the 1.25 million spreads that match my specific criteria, what I told the system to find me. And as you see, of course, with just a few changes, I have narrowed this completely down to just 39 results. So those 1.2, 1.2 million, 1.25 million spreads. Um, that's what we're looking for. Um, okay, Susan, I think you're misunderstanding some. Susan asked, could you quickly say those figures again for strike spread? Um, I'm not making a recommendation or suggestion of what to put into the field at all for credit spreads. What I'm saying is that if you wanted to look at 10-point spreads, if I only wanted to look at spreads that had a 10-point strike difference, I could easily just go strike difference to be equal to 10 points. If I'm doing ETFs, for example, which are mostly single strike spreads, and I wanted to limit it to only, let's say, less than two strike differences, um, two strikes between the spreads, well, I might just select less than two. Or if I'm doing spreads on ETFs, and I wanted to make sure they're greater than five points, I would just use the strike difference field to select greater than five points as well. I, I don't have any particular preference or no particular recommendation. Um, that's, it's just what I'm looking for based on my, my criteria. I know that most customers I talk to who do ETFs, by the way, Susan, usually tend to focus on just one or two strike spread differences. Um, when I'm doing standard stocks, I'm usually looking at just 2.5 to 5 point spreads. That's my personal preference. Um, of course, when we go up higher into the indexes, some of those uh, broad-based indexes, when you're doing iron condors, you can't do that because you only, they only have 15 point spreads or maybe even 25 point spreads as a minimum once you get above $2,000, for example, on the listed indexes. So it becomes tough. And the other thing I was mentioning, uh, Susan, is that you instead of using the strike difference field, you can also just use the maximum risk range. Because uh, remember, the maximum risk in a spread is typically defined as the difference in strike prices minus the net credit. When I put in this maximum risk of less than 950, that took out essentially any of the 15 point spreads or 20 point spreads that might have been in my results, such as the price line position that we saw originally, the second position that was listed there, that had a 15 point spread and the max, I'm thinking it had a 20 point spread, I apologize, and I saw quickly the maximum risk was about 1680. So we filtered that out there by using the maximum risk field. All right, so we have our results. Use the more information button to look at the stock chart. Next thing I always do is typically go to the company news and information. I want to take a look at the news, um, see if there's any headlines out there that might cause me hesitation for entering the position. Take a look at maybe the last earnings and events or the profile. 
Now, when I'm doing a credit spread or a debit spread, um, even if I'm doing a married put or a collar, one thing I'll do is if I've gone through now and I decided I like the chart,